<clears throat> okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Michelle Tovar. I am Associate Director of Education, focusing on Latino initiatives here at Holocaust Museum Houston. Before we begin tonight's presentation, we want to take a moment to acknowledge the ancestral land that Holocaust Museum in Houston resides on with a blessing by Monica Viral. Monica Viral is a dancer, danza azteca dancer and interdisciplinary artist a community activist and who is a native to Houston. Her art explores ethnic identity, gender roles, migrant and environmental issues. She is a recipient of multiple awards in photography and filmmaking and has participated in installation and performing art productions with Voices Breaking Boundaries and Project Grove Houses. So I'll go ahead and share my screen for just a moment. Tlazucamati, Tlazucamati que salco a Tlazucamati, Chipito de Tlazucamati, Tezcalipoca, Tlazucamati, Huisilo Poshli, Tlazucamati, Tata Donati, Tlazucamati, Donan Sinclali, Tlazucamati, Nana Mesli, Tlazucamati, a todos ustedes por estar aquí, a los guardianes de esta tierra, los guardianes de este lugar, Tlazucamati. My name is Monica Villarreal. I am a member of the Mexica people from Tejaslan, Nuevo León, y Tamaulipas. I was asked to give the land acknowledgement to this land, where for many generations was the responsibility of my people. The language I just spoke was Nahuatl, a traditional indigenous language used by many people who roam these lands for trading, migration, and land stewardship. By speaking this language, I am not only welcoming all of you, but all of your ancestors, the ancestors you carry with you. With this land acknowledgement, it is important to understand that the land you live in, you work and raise your children are indigenous lands that have been stolen from their original caretakers. Tejas was a region rich in edible foliage, wild animals and trade, Native groups such as the Coronqua, Squawiltecan, Lipan Apache, Carizo Come Crudo, Camanches, to name a few, roamed these lands before the conquest of Christopher Columbus. There is no such thing as a person being illegal. We did not cross the borders, the border crossed us. Even if our lands have been taken from us and our language and culture oppressed, we are still able to reclaim the biggest responsibility left by our ancestors. And that is to live, to prosper, and to protect our mother earth. Nuestra Madrecita Donan Sinclari. Taso Kamati for being here, for listening to my words, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you to the Holocaust Museum for inviting me and trusting me to do this very important work. We do not just celebrate indigenous people for one month in our household. We celebrate year, all year long. And I hope that the celebration continues in our institutions and in our schools. Tasukamati. Thank you so much, Monica. Special thanks also to the Houston Coalition Against Hate for co-sponsoring tonight's event. We ask you to please submit your questions in the chat box or Q&A box, and we'll come back to them at the end of the presentation. Tonight, we host Greg Deal, who is a provocative contemporary artist who challenges Western perceptions of indigenous peoples, touching on race, issues of race, history, and stereotypes. Through his work, paintings, mural work, performance art, filmmaking, and spoken word, Deal critically examines issues and tells stories of decolonization and appropriation that affect Indian country. Deal's activism exists in his art, as well as his participation in political movements. He has been heavily involved with the media activist movement, hashtag change the name, posting a video to Vemio inviting indigenous people's commentary on sports mascot issues in response to mainstream media's attempted erasure of indigenous voices. Most recently, a photograph of Deal was included in the December 2018 National Geographic Society magazine article, Native Americans are re recasting views of indigenous life. Deal was a native arts 
excuse me, Native Arts Artist in Residence at Denver Art Museum in 2015 through 16, and an Artist in Residence at the UC Berkeley, at UC Berkeley 2017 to 18. Welcome, Greg Deal. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, hi, everybody. Um, well, uh, let me introduce myself first uh, in the language of my people, uh, Hamu, New Greg Deal, Mi Na Nia, New Kiyui Tikara, Nu uh, Tubu, uh, Nu Na'a, Nu Tubudu. Um, my name is Greg Deal. I am a member of the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe, and uh, I am a, a husband and a father and an artist. And um, I just had the strangest moment where I saw the video of myself and uh, actually saw my father, which um, is uh, both disconcerting and kind of funny. So <laughs> um, I appreciate being here um, and appreciate all of you uh, joining me for this. I want to share my work and uh, ultimately uh, get into some questions as well. Um, and before I do that, um, I just wanted to tell a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in Utah. Um, I grew up in a ski resort town uh, my parents uh, made just enough money for us to be poor around white people, and uh, that ultimately um, led to the strange existence of having the privileges of growing up in a ski resort town, uh, like skiing and snowboarding, um, while simultaneously still being, uh, excuse me, um, I uh, have been married for 21 years, and um, or my wife would tell you uh, 21 of the longest years of her life. And uh, we have five kids, which is kind of like having a million kids, especially in the time of COVID. Uh, there's no breaks. And, um, and then of course, we're, we're back to e-learning where we're at. Uh, I, live in Col or I live in Colorado, I live near Colorado Springs. Uh, previous to that, uh, I lived in, in Washington DC, which is where my wife grew up and we lived there for about uh, almost 17 years. And um, moving here was uh, both a desire to get off the East Coast and come West, uh, but to not go back to Utah uh, for a number of personal reasons, not the least of which being that it's a strange culture. Um, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to raise my kids differently than how I grew up. Um, I think we all want that for our kids. Um, I made my bones as an artist in Washington, DC, uh, which is a great place to do it. Um, but it was also a difficult place to do it. Uh, the, the fact that there is a, uh, or there was a sports team named after a racial slur seemed to always come up. And uh, the result was, is I ultimately allowed that, that issue to come up in my work, um, which both emboldened me and um, also allowed me to really think critically through some of the, the issues that lie in plain sight um, in our in American culture and to think critically about those things in a way that would allow me to dismantle them within my own work um, but to also speak to it and to speak to it in a way that would be um, that would help propel our thoughts uh, about these things. I've come to learn a lot of things as a result of that um, not the least of which being that uh, most people don't know anything about indigenous people and uh, lack even basic context to understand uh, the historical ramifications of our existence as well as um, our modern existence. Um, and I have a couple of pieces that will definitely point to that. So if you bear with me for just one moment and uh, I will share the screen here. And Hopefully you can see that. Um, one second, sorry. There we go. All right. So, hopefully you guys can see that. Yes. Um, okay, good. <laughs> um, you know, in the time of COVID, this is just the weirdest and hardest thing, but it's also, uh, so important as you know, you have to learn to speak and you have to learn to be articulate um, without the exchange of uh, looks and oohs and ahs and, and laughter and you know, all that good stuff. Um, 
So I want to show you a couple of paintings. I just want to go through a couple of things and I just want to touch on some specific issues. Uh, much of my work deals in uh, identity and representation um, or invisibility of indigenous people. Um, this being a really good example, uh, there is uh, clearly a real uh, indigenous person and then of course the uh, Cleveland Indians uh, Chief Wahoo. The juxtaposition meant to illustrate the point that these two things are drastically different even though they are often put into the same corner uh, within uh, Western culture if not you know just the United States in general. But in thinking critically about our existence and not just our existence, but also um, the, the representation that we have, uh, there comes up this juxtaposition of uh, challenging Western perception of indigenous existence and by sometimes in subtle ways, you know, in this way, you know, it's a man in a headdress, but he's wearing essentially a ski mask. Uh, this is called the new normal. I created it during the Standing Rock uh, standoff a few years ago, this idea that uh, protesters who are rightfully protesting have to still cover their faces so that they don't get uh, pinched after the fact and how interesting it is that you have to protect yourself in a space that has a constitutional right uh, to, um, to gather and to protest, uh, especially peacefully, uh, which is what was happening up in, in Standing Rock. But again, uh, that juxtaposition of uh, perceptive identity versus actual identity. And also the historical perception of our existence as it pertains to things like Christianity. Um, there's a lot of native people that are Christians and are Christ believers, um, but uh, I don't think anybody can actually look at American Christianity and see the effect that it has had on our um, on our communities. Um, there's a new series of work that I've been working on um, that is called The Others. I just have a couple of images of these. Um, this piece, well, basically the concept is, is that I've reappropriated old comic book images from the 40s and 50s. And um, this is sort of heyday of uh, Americana, uh, Boy Scouts, you know, that kind of thing. And um, I've repurposed them and I've removed the dialogue that exists in them and replaced the dialogue with lyrics from punk rock songs from the 70s, 80s, uh, and, and mostly early 90s. Um, this is from a song uh, from a band called DOA, which is actually a Canadian punk band, um, and have uh, used the lyrics from a song called uh, That's Progress, which is about gentrification. And, uh, and so the lyrics say, you're evicted, it's time to leave, it don't matter if your family's been here 30 years. Um, and and what, what is interesting to me is, you know, growing up, uh, I was very much into uh, punk rock and hip hop. And, um, and then as an adult and, and really sort of reconciling the, the uh, trauma of my own childhood, I, I've been able to take a long, hard look at the things that have affected my art practices, uh, my own sense of belonging and voice, and that whole sort of skate punk, you know, hip hop culture was just a huge part of how I grew up um, and, and how I was trying to identify and um, not ever really realizing until now I'm, I'm 45 uh, and realizing that that these things um, really actually speak to the way that I felt um, that I can actually see the um, the disenfranchisement and uh, seeing the sort of hypocrisy of different aspects of of uh, American culture, how it does or does not apply uh, to my own identity or to my own uh, community and being able to lay those there. And so within this series, I've taken some of that disenfranchisement, some of that language that is similar. Um, obviously, gentrification is not the same as Indian removal, but um, there's certainly some language there that would cross over. And to use these lyrics to speak essentially on my behalf, uh, both homage to how I grew up and to the music that I love, um, but also something that is a true statement that points to the indigenous struggle. Um, same is true with this one. Um, this is from a band called uh, Stiff Little Fingers. And uh, the, um, the song is called Suspect Device. 
they take away our freedom in the name of liberty. Why can't they just clear off? Why can't they let us be? They make us feel indebted for saving, for saving us from hell, and then they put us through it. It's time the bastards fell. And this work is meant to be actually very personal, while it, it seems to be pretty easy to consume uh, in terms of work that can exist out in the you know social media ether. Um, it's also work that it just is very specific to me, um, but the boldness of it has been proven to be very important to me. Um, so I did the DOA piece as a mural in uh, Denver, Colorado, about an hour and a half from where I live, um, and did this piece in a neighborhood that is heavily, heavily, heavily gentrified. And, um, and, and did it sort of as a punch to the gut, but also as uh, an opportunity to raise um, questions. I think that, you know, at least my work, I, I like the idea of discourse. I like the idea of challenging perceptions. I love the idea of creating an opportunity for someone to ask questions. Um, and I think that this, uh, this did that. But pushing those boundaries has been just such an important part of the work um, and you might even say, you know, kind of has this punk aesthetic. Uh, I tend to ask for uh, forgiveness way before I'll ask for permission. Um, this piece is actually in the basement of the art and art history building at CU Boulder. And uh, it's also in the colors of the school. And I was had the opportunity to paint the entire corridor of this area. So if you were to look at a 360 view of uh, where we're standing with this image, um, there's paintings on all sides. Um, but I worked with a couple of people and we made this happen. Your luxury is our displacement uh, in the school colors in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Um, this, is in, uh, this is in Baltimore. Um, it actually happened right after Freddie Gray and there was a discussion happening in the city, uh, a, a, very, a very difficult discussion about um, you know, whose neighborhood is this and about uh, identity and, and issues around, obviously around police brutality. Um, but I created this, it's called the duality of indigeneity. And the idea of it is to challenge again that perception. Um, it begs the question, they have the same face, their hair is different, their clothes or lack of clothes are different. Um, but the, uh, the question that it begs is who's more native? And the answer is, is that they're, they're both native. And the duality of our existence is something that has, uh, has been very difficult for most Americans to really even conceptualize, let alone understand. And uh, that, that we can actually go to ceremony and that we can participate in our cultural wares. Um, and also still like Kendrick Lamar or, you know, punk rock music or, you know, movies or basically the same thing as everybody else. Um, while we are indigenous, we are also Americans. So we're having both an experience that is uh, inherently indigenous, but also inherently American. And that plays a role in our identity as well, um, as I sort of illustrated with the uh, punk rock series. <clears throat> Within my work, I'm also trying to create things from time to time that's not always meant to punch you in the gut, uh, but that is sometimes meant to just be. Um, this piece was created specifically to uh, to be something that anybody could connect with. Um, the earrings that she has on uh, are inherently native. Natives are very proud of their earrings. So that is a, a telling um, a telling item as to like who this person is, uh, if you can't tell by her braids. Um, but this idea of rising up, I mean, coming out of, um, you know, the, the sort of Trump administration and there was these hashtags resist and all these different things that were happening. I wanted to create something that was just simple, that we could just rise up, that we could be better today than we were yesterday, or try to at least be better tomorrow than we were today. Um, and, and as a positive sort of piece, I wanted this to exist in public and had the opportunity to um, do a couple murals of this actually. There's one in Denver, there's one in Boulder, there's one in Telluride, Colorado. Um, there's one in Duluth, of all places, and uh, I've had an opportunity to share this one uh, quite a bit, and um, I love how people react to it and interact with it. Uh, it seems like such a simple thing, uh, but, but I, I am in a unique position to be able to see the effect that this has, um, and I'm, I'm very proud of it. 
So a big part of my work, um, certainly the work that sort of landed me on the map artistically uh, is performance art. And performance art is not something that I ever counted on. Uh, I, when I went to school, my concentration was in painting uh, and graphic design and uh, even a little bit of filmmaking. I, I was a film major when I started and I changed my major to filmmaking, uh, from filmmaking to, uh, to an art major. And, um, but I had the opportunity to win, a, uh, to win a mentorship with an indigenous artist by the name of James Luna, somebody that I studied in a performing art class that I took um, that was honestly uh, kind of hokey and I kind of hated it. <laughs> but but the, the, the professor did introduce me to James's work and I loved his work because his work was just unapologetically indigenous. And um, I won a mentorship a year later when I was working at the National Museum of American Indians, uh, the inaugural year that that uh, Smithsonian Institution opened on the National Mall. And um, it just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And so I won this mentorship. I went with him uh, to Venice, Italy to uh, help him out with the Venice Biennale, his representation at the Venice Biennale, which was being supported by the National Museum of American Indians. And um, he pulled me into his performances and, and uh, frankly, it was, it was uh, eye-opening and life-changing. I immediately went back to the Smithsonian after a few weeks in Italy and, and I quit. Uh, and my wife, was uh, I think supportive. Uh, <laughs> she she was a little there was a little trepidation in there, um, and uh, but we went for it anyways. Um, a, a recession and uh, several jobs and you know ideas of jobs later, um, I created a performance piece, my first performance piece that sort of debuted in 2013, and it was called "The Last American Indian on Earth." Um, and the, essentially the, the concept was this. Uh, I would wear a store-bought, over-the-counter sold uh, native regalia, use air quotes when I say that. Um, the headdress I believe is made in China, the leggings and the breech cloth and everything is like uh, kits that are sold in Mexico or in some other country that is not by in, necessarily by indigenous hands. Um, and essentially embody the stereotype. And I walked around and I just was in spaces. Um, this is not a, um, this is not a posed image. This family uh, actually came up to me and they wanted to take a photograph with me. And uh, the guy wanted to point at his Cleveland Indians hat. Um, and this was really important because we're in the middle of like a mascot debate and a stereotype debate, a cultural appropriation debate in 2013. We're really starting to build, not just in the indigenous community, but you can also see it in other marginalized communities, in the black community, in the, uh, you know, Chicano community, um, and, and in uh, people that are in on different sexual spectrums. You're just seeing all these conversations happening and people beginning to define things that have never really been defined, at least not on a, not on a grand scale. And so this ended up sort of being a part of that, which is how I got tied into um, the mascot debate. But uh, it ended up being this really interesting piece that I was able to create different scenarios. Um, I, was, I was able to essentially take up space uh, and sort of just have a presence in different spaces. I was all over DC. Um, I was, I went to the Lincoln Memorial a lot because that's kind of like Disneyland. Everybody goes to the Lincoln Memorial. Um, I was in New York City. I was in Santa Fe. I went to LA. I went to Portland and, um, and nothing really, you know, had the response like Washington DC did because even for people that came from other countries that didn't speak English, um, that they, um, automatically associated my presence with the Washington football team, which is uh, really telling to how uh, effective that stereotype has been for five years. Um, I did this piece on Columbus Day in Washington, D.C., so uh, this was in 2013. It's also interesting because I would just take up space holding signs sometimes. Um, I had a sign, uh, and I wish I would have included it here, but um, I had a sign at the Lincoln Memorial that said, uh, that said my spirit animal is white gill, uh, which is meant to be tongue in cheek, uh, and of course means something completely different in 2013 than it does today. 
um, as there's been different conversations about whiteness and you know who's offended by what. Um, but uh, but that whole piece is meant to play on the tropes that exist in popular culture that spirit animals are appropriate when they're absolutely not. Um, when uh, you know we're making statements about what our spirit animal is and just really trying to poke at people um, and to get them to think uh, more critically or honestly to to get confrontational which also happened from time to time um i did a short film about this it's actually on my website uh gregdeal.com uh, it's about 20 minutes long and and so it's it's on there if you feel so inclined um there was a couple of pieces that i created in in dc that i think were important and eye-opening for me um this piece is actually called red skin uh one one word singular um and I had four antagonizers essentially speak to me in the language that exists in the comment section of any uh, article about the Washington football team. And that was important because most of the language that exists there is incredibly problematic, but is also um, microaggressive. So other people might not see it, they might not pay as much attention to it. So my idea was, what if I had four non-native people concentrating this language on me for several hours um, over the in installation so i'm actually created an installation for an event in washington dc called uh, art all night and i sat in the middle of this room and i took this language for um i think we did it for like six hours and uh it was incredibly difficult uh, but it was incredibly eye-opening as well. It, microaggressions don't look so micro when they're concentrated on one person in that way. Um, and it was an incredibly difficult piece to do, and I think, uh, you know, required an element of sacrifice to it. But at the same time, it was also telling because each of these individuals who are friends of mine, who I, in some cases, had to convince to participate in this, uh, one of which was um, a professor at Georgetown of, uh, of critical race theory. Uh, another one is an anthropologist. Um, the guy that is on the back on, on my left is actually a really good friend of mine in Central Virginia who's been in a couple of works that I've done. Um, and uh, the, the woman on the right, Daphna, is also a professor. And uh, it was interesting because the next day, you know, I was up all night, hence the name Art All Night. And I was watching cartoons with my kids on the couch and I started getting text messages and phone calls from each of these four individuals. And they were all struggling with everything that was happening. They, they felt terrible and they said words like, the, like shame and they apologized and it, things got a little bit out of hand, which I think really points to sort of mob mentality and how that works. Um, but it was interesting to me because they were just not equipped to deal with the ramifications of what happened after this piece, uh, where I was fine and, and, you know, pointing to the fact that I am equipped to deal with those things, which I think is, um, you know, maybe disturbing because we shouldn't be comfortable with things like that. But uh, we have the devices that we need to sort of get past those things most of the time. And so that was a really interesting aspect of this piece um, that, uh, that I don't get to talk about very much. Um, in 2016, I did a piece, um, well, I was actually part of a Smithsonian uh, group in 2016 that was called um, uh, Cross Lines, an inter, or, uh, culture lab on intersectionality, and there was like 40 plus artists in this space that were doing different things, and everybody was from different places. I mean, there was like, you know, 40 plus artists, there was maybe like two white artists, and everybody else was, you know, everything from... Uh, from the South Pacific, from, you know, Africa, from African American, uh, Chicano, uh, South America, like it was just, it was a really, really rich um, uh, exhibit. And it was sort of a pop up. It was at, with the Smithsonian and at the Arts and Industry building, which is the Smithsonian's second building. It was built on the National Mall next to the, the Smithsonian Castle, which is uh, much more famous. Um, but what happened in this space was uh, there was some censorship that was happening with a couple of artists, uh, happened to be myself, uh, and this Muslim performance artist that you can see here, uh, her name is um, uh, Anita Yo Ali, 
a good friend of mine. We became good friends because we were having this shared experience within the Smithsonian. But we had decided, if you remember the name, it's called a culture lab on intersectionality. We had decided to intersect. Um, she was at the apex of the building surrounded by American flags. Uh, I erected a 27 foot tall teepee and filled it with, um, I filled it with paintings. The original concept was to fill it with Ikea furniture, uh, but wasn't able to do that because of the uh, upper echelon of the Smithsonian and the, um, what is the, the Office of, of Public Affairs. were really concerned about how I was going to interact with people for this performance piece and how she was going to interact with people in this performance piece. So we had to compromise a lot. There was a lot of censorship and a lot of regulation happening. We had decided that we were going to go into each other's spaces and I was pretty excited to go into hers. Um, at the apex of the building is a fountain that was built and then uh, they built a, a stage on top of this old fountain and she was surrounded by American flags as you can see. And the idea was that we would stand together on this stage and if you remember in 2016 there was a, uh, a presidential candidate running that was demonizing Muslim people and so we had thought that that this might be interesting because um, you know Standing Rock came up uh, right after this, uh, or it may have been happening actually right as this happened, and uh, and so there was all of these these different issues that were sort of converging in the same place, and we did this, we stood there together for several minutes. It lasted, if I remember right, it lasted about six minutes. We decided to call it existence as protest. And I didn't realize it until this moment, just how profound something like this can be, that indigenous people who have been, you know, historically marginalized, this flag sort of being a symbol of those things. And then this Muslim American woman who is um, also sort of suffering the same type of ostracizing that has come with with uh, sort of canned patriotism and things. And her whole piece was about like, can a Muslim American be a patriot? And so it's just incredibly interesting. And when we're standing there together, I think it really tied it together into something uh, until uh, we were forcibly removed off of the stage, um, which was disheartening, but I was also mildly proud of that because uh, I think that when, people are afraid of art when art is perceived as dangerous uh, that's when you can find a lot of power in it so existence as protest uh, Anita and I are, are very close to this day I've had a chance to uh, do a residency up at her school that she facilitated since then and I'm hoping at some point that we can do um, a collaboration together to sort of finish what we started um, I just have a couple of pieces I want to share that are left um, this is my latest uh, piece. I actually did this in 2018. My daughter is in this image, she's 12. And we're wearing uh, in, indigenous regalia. Uh, she's wearing a jingle dress. I'm wearing a men's Northern traditional outfit. And I had this idea of stripping these things down because if you've ever been to a powwow, if you've ever seen like dance regalia, it's usually very, um, it's very uh, colorful and it sort of amplifies the movement. And I had this idea, like, what if I stripped the color out of it? And so that's what we did. Um, it's black beadwork, black ribbon work, black, uh, black uh, garments, uh, black um, everything. And uh, it takes away the color. And this is the first piece I've ever done that has like a, a significant metaphor attached to it. That even though we're in the sunlight, as you can see, you can still barely make out the details of what's being worn. And the metaphor to that is that uh, that we are a shadow, that we exist, but we don't exist, that we're here, but we're not here, um, that you can see us, but you can't see us, that we are but a shadow of um, of your perception of us, of what we're supposed to be. Uh, Native people are, you know, the most invisible, visible people in the country. Um, and so I wanted to create something that that played into that. Um, and this is the first time I've also brought uh, a member of my family into, uh, into this piece. I was very proud of Sage, uh, who is now 14. Um, and she just uh, rises to the occasion. It's uh, always nice for a parent to see. Um, I did a version of this called Invisible Eulogy using the same outfit, again, using presence and using that same set of metaphors about existing, but not existing, about being visible, but invisible, about being here, but not here. 
And then uh, about a year later, um, in 2019, uh, we were asked, Sage and I were asked to do the same piece we did. But of course, a 12 year old that turns into a 13 year old is growing a lot. And so uh, she ultimately ended up uh, not fitting into her original outfit. So we worked together um, and I let her lead the way on what she wanted to do. And so she chose to do a piece that we called Invisible that is still under the same umbrella as the original, the original works. The way that it worked is this, she's wearing a red ribbon skirt, a traditional skirt for, um, for uh, women, indigenous women. She's wearing a t-shirt noting missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit. And for those of you that don't know, two-spirit is a fancy way of saying LGBTQ+. Um, many of our communities in their traditional sense have a place uh, that is appropriate and ultimately even uh, risen up above a lot of other people in our communities for those that identify on a different uh, sexual spectrum. Um, she's wearing a red handprint on her face to denote the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women. She came up with a spoken word piece and then she read the names of uh, women, girls, and two-spirit that are either missing and or murdered. Um, we did it for 10 minutes. She's standing on a plinth in downtown uh, Denver. Again, rising to the occasion, she was so nervous about this, but she really just, she, she took hold of it. It was pretty incredible. Um, Sage is really wanting to be an artist and I'm trying to uh, allow as many opportunities as possible for her to be able to have experiences to, to really figure out what she wants to do and how she wants to do it. Um, which I think, uh, you know, any parent tries to do, We're, you know, trying to give our children better than what we had. I, I do what I do because I just figured it out and I want her to not have any excuses to be able to do whatever it is that she wants to do uh, within the art world. And so it's been pretty awesome to watch her be able to do that. You'll see her pop up here in another minute. Um, I wanted to share this last couple of pieces are some pieces that I did this summer. Um, this piece is called Modern Indigenous Living. And uh, it's been in play for about two years. We've been working on it for about two years. And it is the original version of the Smithsonian one that I talked about, because the original Smithsonian one was supposed to be a teepee filled with Ikea furniture, um, and it didn't work out that way. And uh, so this group, uh, the Art Student League of Denver, uh, heard about this project and was like, hey, if we can raise the funds to do this, would you be willing to do it? And so we worked together to make this happen. So this is the original teepee from the Smithsonian installation in 2016. Um, me and uh, another artist, uh, his name is JC Bayal. Um, we both have graffiti backgrounds from the 90s, so we worked on the outside to make it look like it's been graffitied as, as any building is in you know urban areas. Um, and there's references here like Red Powers in reference to the civil rights movement of Indian people and uh, the, you know, towards the end of the 60s and into the 70s, um, which followed Alcatraz, uh, the occupation of Alcatraz, the Wounded Knee standoff, the occupation of um, the Department of the Interior Building in, in Washington, D.C., and what they called the Trail of Broken Treaties that ended in Washington, D.C. Um, and then there's even statements on there, Black Lives Matter on Native land. Um, there's, uh, you can see a sort of peace symbol with a face attached to it that's the old American Indian movement symbol. And so we wanted to put some things on there that, that would uh, speak to indigenous people with a little subversiveness but, and, and still have relevance in terms of looking like uh, a piece of graffitied work. And I filled the space with, uh, with furniture and with blankets and with books. There's a lot of little subtle things here like the sign that's on the dresser, it actually says Columbusing, the act of discovering something that is not new. Um, th there was a number of people like after I finished the installation before the performance piece, which is what I'm doing here, um, some people broke into it. Uh, there's a headdress in the space. They stole the headdress. They stole a blanket. Um, and later on, uh, the chair that I'm sitting on was actually stolen as well. It's an old Ikea chair that I had splattered with paint and has been in about three different installations since uh, 2010, I would say. Um, and somebody stole that too, uh, to my daughter's uh, total dismay because it was in her room <laughs> when I took it. Um, the books are even, you know, there's even a statement within the books 
uh, the top row of books are all written by native authors. All the books below that are written by uh, white authors about natives. And uh, I labeled the, the books with native authors um, as nonfiction, regardless of their subject matter. And I labeled all of the books below that as fiction, a statement about who gets to tell our stories and whether or not those stories are right or true. Um, you can see the others, uh, the punk rock series paintings in the background, um, even the sculptures, the gold one that's on my right, uh, or on your right, my left, uh, in the image is, um, is like one of these Hobby Lobby uh, Indian sculptures. I painted it gold. Uh, I, I called it the, um, I called it the, uh, the God of Consumption, uh, that it's meant to be like an idol. Um, then there's the other sculpture that's on the left. Um, it's actually black and it's painted completely black. And it's meant to be the same as sort of the um, invisible loss movement, uh, you know, the invisibility situation. Um, and so that's meant to be there as well. And in the performance piece, I was just in the space. And then afterwards, I spoke during the performance piece and I talked about identity and I talked about uh, whether or not I'm native. Am I native enough because my skin is brown? Am I native enough because, uh, because of the way I uh, dress or because of the way I talk? Am I native enough um, because of where I live? Am I native enough because of the length of my hair? And then I very promptly took a pair of scissors out and I chopped off my braids while sitting there. And there was this audible gasp in the group and uh, it was fantastic and disheartening kind of all at the same time. Um, my hair hasn't been cut in over seven years and, uh, and this just sort of landed in this moment. And after I cut it, I said, am I uh, more or less native now uh, that my hair is a little bit shorter? And all of this pointing to the fact that this, this concept, even modern indigenous living is uh, predicated upon the perception of our existence. Uh, the TP is identifiable. Um, the blankets are identifiable. Uh, you know, feathers are identifiable. Long hair is identifiable. There's all these elements that I was able to do with this piece that all pointed to this being both valid and invalid. Uh, because our existence so much is, is struggling with this sort of perception of what we're supposed to be and not the perception of what we actually are. And so, yeah, my hair is long, but does it need to be um, in order for me to be an indigenous person, in order, in order for me to be counted among my people? And uh, so this was a, a, an incredible piece and I was just incredibly, uh, I felt incredibly lucky to be able to do that this summer. Um, it was supposed to happen in April, um, it didn't happen until October. I just broke it down a few weeks ago. It was up for about uh, three months. Um, I actually went up in, uh, sorry, in August uh, and was up for three months. And so, uh, yeah, that's modern indigenous living. You guys are kind of getting, if you weren't there, you're getting like the first look of it. Um, I was also able to do a mural this summer in Colorado Springs near where I live. Um, this is called Take Back the Power. Uh, it is 77 feet tall, which you don't realize how tall that is until you're standing right in front of it. Um, there was a couple things with this. One, uh, this is, of course, Sage. Uh, she's a model, and, uh, or my model, at least. And, um, and I always say the most important indigenous woman in my life, uh, her and her little sister. And uh, she has got the handprint on her face, which, of course, is to note missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit. Um, she's wearing a band t-shirt of her favorite band, The Interrupters, um, which is meant to point you towards the fact that she is a real living modern indigenous person, um, something that seems to be a fairly novel concept and something that nat Native people are really fighting against now, that we are a modern living people, that we're not a relic, um, and that we still exist, that we're still here. And the halo around her head, somebody asked me if that was about heaven or any of those things and the answer to that is no it's about divinity uh in old renaissance paintings of christ and of the immaculate conception so you know mother mary um those halos are there to denote that divinity but judeo-christian uh values essentially decided it first contact and well beyond 
that we were not divine, that we were inherently evil and that we were pagans and that we were terrible and dirty and, and all these things. Meanwhile, we believe in our traditional sense that we, uh, the divinity is ours to, for the taking, that our women are divine, that our children are divine, that our two spirit are divine. And that these are not things that are just said arbitrarily, but things that are worked into our, uh, into our communities and into our culture. Um, I was very proud of this. And uh, if you can imagine being a 14 year old, uh, having this huge painting, um, the interrupters, the band that uh, the t-shirt she's wearing, they, they found out about this and they posted it all over their Instagram. Um, and, uh, and then they made a t-shirt because they wanted to contribute to the issue uh, and made a t-shirt and donated all the funds of that t-shirt to uh, an organization that works on missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit. And um, if you can imagine being a 14-year-old in your favorite band, uh, made a t-shirt of your face uh, for, for the band. In fact, I think I have one right here. I can show you. They use the original source image um, as, the, uh, as the image. So Sage is now on the face of uh, her favorite band, uh, a t-shirt, which I think is pretty awesome. I can't imagine being 14 and doing that. Um, I did a similar piece uh, for um, another mural event in Denver, or I'm sorry, in Boulder. Um, and on this one, honestly, I was uh, playing around with some new concepts and new ideas of color and how color might work. Um, again, it's Sage, and again, she does have the red handprint on her face. So that's something that I've been working on this, this year. And I wanted to close with this last piece um, that I did in Denver, which is part of the other series, the Punk Rock series. Um, it's called Merica, that is apostrophe M, <laughs> uh, which is the name of a song uh, done by the Descendants. Um, it's actually a Bush era song, so it's an early 2000s song. Um, and I wanted to create something that would sort of point towards the year that we've been having, uh, particularly in the, the sort of um, racial and political conversations that we're having nationally. Uh, we flipped our finger to the King of England, says the, uh, says the colonialists. We stole our country from the Indians with God on our side and guns in our hands. We took it for our own. A nation dedicated to liberty, justice, and equality. And the native is saying, does it look that way to you? It doesn't look that way to me, the sickest joke I know. Uh, this is in Denver in a downtown area. And um, I suppose it's meant to be provocative, uh, but mo above all else, I think it's meant to be true. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to, uh, to watch and to listen. Um, and uh, I'm excited about uh, some questions. Thank you so much. You just brought me back to my skater days with all these punk bands you brought up. Um, but thank you again. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience. Um, we have some questions that regard regarding the community's response to your murals, um, especially in uh, gentrified and predominantly white spaces. Um, it's mixed. Uh, I mean, there was the, the piece that I did with the guy in the horse um, was last year. Um, and the piece that I just showed you guys is actually this year in the same neighborhood. Um, it's for a large mural event in Denver called Crush uh, or Crush Walls. And um, that other one, like a lot of people reacted really well to it. Um, but then there was a number of people that, that actually defaced it um, and went and graffitied it. One guy took a Sharpie. I don't know who's carrying a Sharpie around, but um, some guy's carrying a Sharpie around that, that wrote, uh, racist as F, of course, spelling out the, the F word. Um, and uh, all of which I think aligns with sort of this strange discourse we're having coming out of the, the Trump administration um, about whiteness and, and racism and what these things mean. Um, so I think that's interesting. Um, this one, you know, the, the last one that I did, the one that I just showed you guys, which is also in a heavily gentrified area, um, it's really strange uh, because it's also a pretty progressive or it's sort of like a, a white liberal area. Um, and it's really strange because uh, nobody seems to be offended by this and nobody, and like for the first time in my life, I never thought this would happen. Um, I, white girls in spandex are offering to buy me lunch and coffee because they are appreciative of what I'm doing. So that's a weird thing that happened. Um, <laughs> it's it's been a mixed bag, uh, but the mural event that we're in just in general um, allows for 
anybody to do anything. They don't censor anybody's work. So you can ultimately come in and do whatever you want, uh, which is, which is pretty refreshing. Um, but I don't know. I also don't know how much I trust that. So uh, I'm sure there's a line somewhere someone can cross. So someone as an educator was asking, how can they incorporate uh, indigenous narratives and histories and art into the classroom? Um, I think that, um, I actually think it's really easy. Uh, first off, um, where do you live? Who was there before you? Uh, you know, what did that look like? You know, things like land recognitions are really important because they give us some of that information. Um, but you should never stop at a land recognition. Uh, to, to recognize something is to state that something is missing, that something uh, needs to be filled. There's a gap that needs to be filled. Um, filling that gap doesn't happen by saying, okay, I recognize. It, there's another step. And so there's a number of books out there. Um, I mean, Howard Zinn wrote books that were pretty, uh, pretty powerful because they, they looked at history from the perspective of the oppressed and not from the perspective of the oppressor. Um, there's another book out there called, uh, I, I believe it's called um, The Indigenous Peoples uh, America or something, uh, His, History of America. That's got a lot of good information in it. Um, there's a book by a, a writer in Canada called uh, The Inconvenient Indian. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that one because it, is a history book that doesn't read like stereo instructions. So that's always nice. Um, and there's, um, gosh, there's a number of other books that would give you information that you could incorporate in the classroom that, especially if you're working with little ones, you wouldn't necessarily be able to read. Uh, Vine Deloria is an author that is, uh, he has said, he's like a philosopher, you know, in terms of looking at the civil rights movement uh, and beyond. So he has books called like God is Red, which is about religion and the way that religion affected indigenous communities. He has another book called Custard Died for Your Sins, uh, which is a fantastic title. Um, but it was, it's, it's about the movement and all the different things that were happening during the American Indian movement. Um, and all of those things, unfortunately, are just absolutely still relevant today. Not even just looking at it from a perspective of, um, of uh, history and looking at civil rights the way that we're looking at Malcolm X or Martin Luther King, um, but also in the fact that most of those things like the civil rights movement, like the black civil rights movement, are still painfully relevant still today. Um, and so I think they beget information that is important. Uh, you know, Columbus Day comes up, most teachers do something for Columbus Day. Uh, wipe that off your list, do something Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, Thanksgiving is, uh, is a tough one. Uh, that's a dual holiday because there's people that are very proud of the colonization of the United States. It's a national holiday, but I think you can still have a very honest conversation about what happened, uh, what the pilgrims did to, uh, to the indigenous people that they were in touch with. So I think that we can stop omitting information in our curriculums so that we can begin to normalize these stories and normalize the existence of indigenous people and the indigenous uh, struggle to our young people. Um, and then our young people will grow up realizing that these are things that, uh, that maybe don't look so good on, on sort of our national uh, identity. Right. Uh, do you think art and culture is the key to social movement and how can it mobilize people? Read that one more time. That was a good one. <laughs> is art and culture a key to any social movement and how can it mobilize people? I believe that um, art absolutely is. Um, it, because art tends to be like the culture holders. I mean, for, for native people, artists are like medicine people. And, uh, and so there's um, healing that can come from that and uh, perspective and ideas. Um, you know, a lot of artists are philosophers. They have thought through these things that, you know, schools teach and sort of popular culture teaches that art doesn't have uh, value that, you know, there's the parents that, that are like, oh my gosh, my kid's going to be an artist, that, that this is some terrible thing. Art is, art is really just the only um, industry that doesn't have a machine attached to it. So like if I get, you know, if I get a uh, business degree uh, and then I get an unpaid internship, I'm not making any money, uh, you know, your parents are cheering you on. They're like, you made it, you know, keep going. And then maybe that 
that unpaid internship turns into a, a really low paying job. It's so low that maybe you have to bag groceries on the weekend or, you know, wait tables or whatever. But eventually you build your reputation until you can get to a point where you have years of experience. You can make more until you can finally maybe, you know, make a mortgage payment, make a car payment, you know, all of the things that go with that. It's, it's a progress that's set up specifically for, um, with this idea of like that there's a system but when you become an artist and you finish school you're not making any money kind of like an unpaid internship and then when you do actually make money you're not making that much because you have to build up your reputation and uh and so those things build and build and build and there is value not just as a career choice but value in recognizing sort of the the comments that come with that you know like the daily show it's comedy and it's satire, it's writing, it's all of those things. Man, that thing speaks to, to you know, every situation in our country. Um, and it's one of the things that helped a lot of hardcore fans of the Washington football team change their mind because I was on The Daily Show and there was a whole bunch of us and we talked about that issue. And that humor twists it just enough that you can see it from a different perspective. Um, art does all of those things. And I don't think that there's been a time that has illustrated that more than the Black Lives Matter movement this summer. The amount of art that happened during that time and place, posters, stickers, paintings on, on the street in front of Capitol buildings. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And while there's organizations that help perpetuate that, um, there's one organization called Amplifier that's out of Seattle that really was working on a lot of that stuff. Uh, COVID responses, Black Lives Matter responses, uh, you know, all kinds of issues since, honestly, since the Women's March, since they sort of really uh, blew up, um, has, has helped perpetuate those things and harbor artists that are, want to get their work out there in, in this new and exciting way. And museums are beginning to recognize that art and activism is a viable movement within the art world. Um, and in particular, I think here in the United States. Um, so yeah, I think that it's incredibly important and incredibly moving and has way more power than I think anybody uh, gives credit, credit to art for. So this is the first year our museum is actually hosting an Indigenous Heritage Month series. Um, and so we do have a great question about the, since I'm focused on Latino issues, uh, someone has asked, how do we empower Native and Latino communities who have Native roots to this part of the world um, as well? And, and as well, and when we see our demographics coming back to balance after 500 years, to realize that this power and respect that they should come with our numbers. So I'm guessing how do we, the person is saying, how do we empower these communities together with these native roots and, and with respect to native indigenous uh, communities? Ooh. <laughs> <It's tough>. um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, I mean, cause we're, we're seeing this happen now. Like there is at one time, I remember there was a fair amount of prejudice uh, between North American indigenous people and Chicanos uh, that um, like my people are from Nevada, which of course uh, was at one time Mexican territory. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the border tribes too, uh, Navajo and the Apache and the Hopi, um, a lot of them are mixed between, you know, their tribal roots and, and being uh, Chicano. And, uh, so we're seeing like a significant change, you know, that like North American indigenous people are, um, are, you know, calling anybody who's come from the South, our brothers and our sisters, you know, our relations. Um, so we're beginning to see that. Um, I think that we have to be a little bit careful because uh, there is a legitimate indigenous claim uh, for people who are South of, of the United States border. Um, but we have to be careful because the things that are out there are um, are really the stereotype, the headdresses and those things. And those headdresses are very specific to a very specific origin and placement in the United States. There's like 574 tribes that are federally recognized in the United States, uh, at least a few hundred more that aren't recognized. They might be recognized on a state level or even not at all. And uh, of that many people, maybe a dozen wear the headdress as we know it traditionally. And so I know in Colorado, because there's, there's uh, a huge uh, Chicano population here, 
um, and has been uh, part of a, a big sort of civil rights movement as well, uh, particularly in the late 60s and into the 70s. Um, but there's this gravitation towards wanting to identify with indigenous roots and automatically siding with uh, the stereotype. And a lot of that has to do with colonization. You know, colonization in North America was very much about killing everybody and then separating everybody and then assimilating everybody. Uh, colonization south of the border has been uh, all about uh, force assimilation you know, immediately just forcing everybody to speak your language and to, you know, women are being violated and it's mixing bloodlines and is doing all these different things. And so there's a different set of circumstances that have been created um, within that. If we can identify that, if we can tread lightly and be respectful of one another, um, yeah, there's strength in numbers. There's incredible strength in numbers because, you know, I think I put up a tweet uh, that says that only in a country this twisted can the uh, indigenous people of these continents um, be viewed as foreigners in their own lands. And that's where we're at now because those borders weren't there. Trade was happening. People were coming from Central America to North America. And that was all like a normal thing. And, you know, those damn Apaches, they were going everywhere. So, you know, it's like all these things have happened and they stopped as a result of colonization and borders and lines and you know all property and all this other stuff. I think there's an enormous amount of power there. And I think you're already, if, if you're in the know, if you see it, it's already happening. It's already happening what's the, the power that is building. I don't know if that answers your question. That sort of was a great. No, that's great. <laughs> Leslie, are you, Prince, are, is your work available to purchase? Where can people see your work? Yeah, um, uh, gregdeal.com. Um, I have a print shop uh, that that uh, is the link is on my website. It's g r e g g d e a l dot com. Um, and then I'm on Instagram a fair amount, so most of my most current stuff is up on Instagram. Um, I actually I have a running joke because uh, uh, I do gallery shows occasionally. I I move more work on Instagram in a year than I have in every gallery show that I've done my entire career. So um, that's a good place because I get to post stuff about my family, about what I'm doing, about what's happening. And so there's a lot of good information there, but I'm easy to find. Um, it, it doesn't take much to find me, I don't think. Well, thank you, Greg, for joining us and our viewers for joining us this evening. Our next event is November 30th and we will feature the film screening of The Condor and the Eagle. For more info and to register, please visit our website at hmh.org slash events. Thanks again for tuning in. Thank you, Greg. This was incredible meeting you and getting to uh, learn more about your work. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good evening, everyone.